I think we're going to get started. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This is such a great welcome. Um, I'm glad the turnout is as strong as it is. I see a lot of journalism uh, faces here, and that's also encouraging. Um, Persis wanted to say a few words before we actually got started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Persis Karim. I'm the director of the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies, which is down the hall in 503. And uh, Kathy Bruin, who's here, uh, right there. She's the program assistant. She's organized a Tuesday tea every Tuesday from 2 to 3. We invite you to come and visit us. We have a, just um, an opportunity for you to get familiar with the center. Um, this is our first event of the semester. And I want to thank Venice Wagner for um, partnering with me on this. Uh, Last year, I got this idea that it was time for us to do something with journalism because um, there is no place, I think, more under attack than in the journalism world um, at this moment in time in the US. And, and globally, I would say, journalists are under attack. And um, in particular, I met um, my friend Melissa Etahad uh, two, almost two years ago. Uh, she was doing a story for the LA Times about the prevalence of uh, rhinoplasty, also known as nose jobs among Iranian Americans. And she interviewed me because I had written an essay about that. And we became instant friends. And um, we wanted to have an event where um, we could talk with a journalist about the importance of covering the news and covering in particular events like what's, what are now taking place um, in our country, but also on a, a global stage. Um, as many of you know, the Trump administration has been ramping up the rhetoric of war against Iran. And what we know about that is that from our experience with Iraq, um, it takes public opinion to turn the tide towards something like a war or military confrontation. And journalism and the media have an important role both in revealing truths and undercutting um, what is often misinformation. And also because of the prevalence of uh, the conversation both about fake news and what we now know is a, a kind of churning out of fake news, I think the role of journalists is probably more and more critical in our society um, to protect um, the idea of truth, but also free speech and um, the ability for Americans to understand what's happening. Um, so I, I thought of inviting Melissa, and Jason Rezaian was supposed to be here, but he had a personal conflict today. So we decided just to go ahead with Melissa, and I think I'll leave it to Venice to um, field the questions. I want to encourage you to sign our mailing list and see our upcoming events. We are hosting a major conference in March of 2019, an international conference on the Iranian diaspora. Some of you may find that um, it might not be immediately on your radar, but I hope you'll join us. Um, we, we're pretty excited about it. And we're also hosting two art exhibits in San Francisco. So um, come and visit us in Humanities 503. And thank you all for being here. Uh, with that, I'll share with you um, some background information about Melissa. She's a Los Angeles Times reporter and is an Iranian American with expertise in foreign news with a particular focus on geopolitics in the Middle East, Iran, and US foreign policy. She's also reported extensively on the issue of Iranian Americans being detained in Iran. So I look forward to being able to talk to her about that. Uh, her reporting has taken her to Greece and Jordan, where she's covered the refugee crisis, as well as Gaza, Egypt, and Israel, where she's written about conflict, war, and terrorism. She's received her, her master's in journalism from, from Columbia University and a bachelor's in international affairs and religion from UC San Diego. She previously worked at Al Jazeera English with their investigative documentary series, Fault Line. And there she worked on two documentaries. One was America's War Workers, and the other one was called Deadly Force, Arming America's Police. Um, Melissa later worked at the Washington Post on the Foreign Desk, and there she covered the intersection of politics, religion, and gender. So thank you so much, Melissa, for being here. Thank you for um, having there, me. There's so many journalism students here in the audience, and I would 
think it would be great if you could talk a little bit about how you got to journalism, where, what brought you there and yeah, what your path was. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be able to talk to journalism students because I have so much to share about how to get a foot in the door. So I'll be giving real talk as much as possible. Um, can you raise your hands? I'm curious how many of you are hoping to become journalists as your profession? Yes. Okay. That's fantastic news because I feel like now is the time when we really need journalists. Um, so a bit about myself. I'm Iranian American. Um, I'm also half Jewish and half Muslim. So when I was an undergrad, I was at UC San Diego and I got really involved in um, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, I have family in Israel, I have family in Iran. Um, and I really took it to heart to understand the conflict. And so when I traveled to Israel, I went to um, the Palestinian territories. Um, and I came back um, to my university with this kind of feeling of I should take responsibility and really try to get both sides to communicate. Um, it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. I'm sure on campus you guys know how tense that conflict can be. Um, but throughout all of that, I realized that maybe my voice would be better served as a journalist. Um, being able to talk to both sides, being able to synthesize those issues. So when I graduated from UCSD, I went to DC and I worked at a think tank for about six months and that was regarding Iranian issues. Um, it was around the time when Rouhani was first elected as president and um, you know he had had that phone call with Obama and everyone was super excited and there was so much hope in the air. And so I figured, okay, this is a perfect time to get into journalism. Um, so I went and I started working at Al Jazeera. And quick lesson about if you want to get that foot in the door, sometimes it's all about <laughs> lying. And I'm not going to say, like, you should totally do it, but my reasoning for lying was good. Um, they said you had to be a student in order to start working um, as an intern at Al Jazeera. And I'm like, oh, gosh, well, I'm not a student any longer, but I managed to kind of make it seem like I was. So I wasn't getting paid at all. Um, and that was for six months. And then for the other six months, I went and I finally got a job with them. Um, and I was in New York. And being able to work at Al Jazeera English was phenomenal. And it's something that I think is missing in American media outlets, which is this idea of really holding the powerful to account and focusing on people who are marginalized and disenfranchised. And that's something that I wish um, mainstream media outlets, including newspapers such as the LA Times and Washington Post and cable TV would focus more on. Um, I decided I wanted to go to Columbia University, which is uh, where I got my focus on writing. And then I went to the Washington Post. Um, and that was just a phenomenal experience to be working there, but also super tough. So for those of you who are taking journalism classes and are writing on deadline, I mean, please just like hone in on those skills because it's something that I realize, oh my gosh, like this is what it's like to be writing on deadline. Um, I'll give you an example of a typical day at the Washington Post. I would get in at 7 a.m. I'd have to file a story by 8.30. Then I'd go in the 9 a.m. meeting and I'd have to pitch a few stories. I'd have to finish one of those stories by 1 p.m finish the other story by like 2.30, go into a 3 p.m. meeting, pitch more stories for that afternoon, and then be able to come in the next day and finish up whatever I didn't finish from the night before. And so this was, I want to say, the summer of um, 2016, 2017, when there was a coup in Turkey. I mean, it was just news event after news event. And you have to be really on top of everything. And you know, as I'm sure all of you are, if you're passionate about it, you just feel so fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really took away from it. And I was left, lucky enough to be able to come back to my hometown of Los Angeles, where I started working as a reporter there ever since. So you said something that was really curious, that you feel like a lot of mainstream newspapers aren't holding the powerful accountable, and they're not really focusing on people who are marginalized. So mm. why do you think that is? You know, I, I feel like from my experience, honestly, it has a lot to do with the people who are in charge in newspapers, and it goes back to this history of having, no offense to anyone in this room, but old, you know, white guys in charge that are the ones to really disseminate what are the things people should be writing about. Um, and so you have people of color who are coming in, you have millennials, you have people who are bringing their own personal experience, such as myself, right? I'm, Jewish, I have you know background in Iran, Israel, and I'm dying to be able to write these things. But if an editor in charge doesn't view that as newsworthy or doesn't view it as something that'll get enough clicks online, 
you know, to generate that business model where you're able to make money off of it, they say don't do it. And I'm sure that all of you, you know, when you have your internships and stuff like that, you know, pitch. That's so important to be able to pitch, do it effectively. You, know, you have to be able to pitch in two to three minutes and get your point across super fast. And I, I remember sitting down even to this day and looking my editor in the face and being like, we have to write about this. It's a diaspora, you know, issue. It's affecting people. It's a national issue because it's happening you know, between Iran and America. And my editor will just be like, in one ear, out the other. And I get so mad when that mm, happens. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Al Jazeera English was just so different. There's a level of um, mission that I feel like it's embedded in their, um, in their journalists. And I think they can arguably be the downside would be it's um, activism. There's not enough you know, neutral um, rhetoric when you're reporting on it. It's more advocacy for, more advocacy. for a community. Necess not necessarily a, an agency or an entity, but advocacy for the, the interests of a community. Exactly. And that's, you know, there's some truth to that. But I feel like for me, and what I'm noticing is the trend these days, I refuse to report on something that I feel like it's a human right issue and make it seem like it's neutral. You know, if, if global warming is an issue and it's actually happening, I'm not going to present that other side to it. No. <laughs> Why would I do that? It's, it's an actual issue. It's a human rights issue. And that's the trend I'm noticing happening slowly, even in the newspapers. I think Al Jazeera might take that a little bit too far, but even then, there's, there's benefits to it. So what would you say are some of the difficult, difficult challenges that journalists who are covering the Middle East, what are they facing now? What are they having to deal with? Hmm. Well, let's just take Iran, for instance. Um, access to Iran is so difficult right now. Um, being able to report effectively on what's happening inside the country, just, there's just lack. There's, there's, it's difficult to get in, first of all, and second of all, the nuances about it people aren't really aware of. So you have reporters you know, who are able to parachute in, for instance, but they don't have the history, they don't have the context to report on it. And so what ends up happening is you're perpetuating this narrative that's just government rhetoric, right? I'll give you an example. This week there was, um, the State Department released this report. It was 48 pages, I have it in my notes. It's called Iran's Destructive Activities, a chronicle of Iran's destructive activities and from the outlaw regime. So if you take that and you report on it, it provides you with no kind of uh, background information on how the U.S. has a history of interference in Iran. So back up a little sure. bit. Outlaw regime, what does that mean? Like, I'm I know. confused by the whole right. title. <laughs> Me too, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's this rhetoric that the Trump administration has perpetuating, you know, from the start, which is that Iran is this state sponsor of terrorism. We saw this in 2000, uh, you know, after the September 11th attack with George W. Bush, Iran is the axis of evil. It's this rhetoric that as journalists, we have to constantly challenge. And the only way to do that, I believe, if, is if you have a really strong grasp on the history. So when you have people who are reporting on it who necessarily aren't from that country, you're just, you know, in this small bubble. Why not challenge these, you know, predominant narratives? Let's validate the other side. And I think one way to do that is by having people of color be the ones reporting on these issues and challenging this narrative that has been dominant right now. Can you talk a little bit about the history? Because we have a lot of young people in here who may not understand US involvement in Iran. So maybe you can give a brief yeah. Brief synopsis. Sure, 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 sure. Um, OK, <coughs> where do I start? It's so complicated. It is. Um, OK, so let's start from 1953. It's when you had the US um, had uh, President Eisenhower and the CIA decided to overthrow the democratically elected prime minister of Iran, who was um, Mohammad Mossadegh at the time. And that was backed by Britain, and the reason for that was because they were upset that Iran had nationalized its oil industry. Again, it goes back to oil. <laughs> and socialism, this idea of socialism, right? Yes, exactly. And so after that, they reinstated the Shah. Fast forward, um, in 79, you had the revolution, and that you know, brought in um, Khomeini and this Islamic kind of idea of um, Islamic politics into um, I'm socialized. sorry, just to interrupt. So yeah. 
who brought in the Shah? And who was he backed by? He was backed by the U.S. and he was brought in um, again with the Western backing. Um, and he stayed there until the revolution happened in 79. You had the Iran-Iraq War, which solidified um, the religious kind of stronghold of Khomeini and whatnot. Um, Another example in 88, 1988, was when the U.S. shot down um, an Iranian passenger uh, jet. Um, I believe over 200 people died. Um, and, I, and I bring that as an important fact in like, the history of what's happened over the last 40 years is that Iranians haven't forgotten that. You know, for them, it's this memory of innocent civilians dying uh, uh, you know, because of what the U.S. did for no reason. Um, so when you see the rhetoric today that Iran is the state sponsor of terrorism, you know, that it's this rogue regime. Um, of course, you know, they're awful in what they're doing to Iranians inside, and you know, women's rights is a huge issue there. But let's also take a step back and look at, well, why is, it the, why is the regime the way it is now? Um, and I believe it's important for journalists to be able to have that back history. So for instance, if any of you are interested in a region or in a specific beat, I mean, really, really become an expert in that. Like use your passion for it and say, I'm gonna master this topic, not just because I wanna write stories about it, but because I wanna be the leading expert on it. And you'll be able to write amazing stories that I feel like what, it's what we need now. <laughs> what are some stories that you think are missing? You said, the, so the narrative is that they're this rogue regime, mm -hmm. but what are the stories we're not hearing out of Iran? That's a really good point. Um, I think this goes for a lot of diaspora communities. You know, you know, if you're Latino, if you're, you know, Chinese, if you're an ex, you know, whatever you are, you should always think of the diaspora community as being a gateway into um, a culture that, you know, or a country that you might not have visited. So Los Angeles, as I'm sure many of you know, is um, home to the largest Iranian community outside Iran. I think Southern California is also um, within that bracket. Um, and we're just not seeing enough stories come out of there. And it's an opportunity for journalists to be able to talk about, you know, how Iranian Americans are affected uh, by what they're hearing on the news, um, how their family back home in Iran is being affected. Um, you know, I did that story about nose jobs, and when I interviewed Persis, I was just fascinated by, you know, why are Iranian Americans, you know, wanting to get so many nose jobs, right? It's, it's fascinating. It's also a lighthearted story. Um, and we're just not seeing enough of that. Why are they? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I should have Persis talk about it. Her essay is phenomenal. Um, it, it's, a, it's a rite of passage, most. And I had the reason I came up with that story, and see, this is how you can take your personal life and, and come up with stories on your own, is that people <laughs> thought that I've gotten a nose job, and I never got a nose job, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I found it curious that so many people in my family thought I did, and that if they hadn't gotten a nose job, there was this pressure on like my cousins to get nose jobs. And so I was like, well, why is that? Um, and it didn't take much convincing, actually, to get my editors interested in it, because I think they were also very curious. That's interesting, right. Yeah. Um, but that story was So, great. you know, I think in a lot of, a lot of communities, there's something about this idea of what beauty is, right? And everyone, it's different in each community, of course, but I think there's also this feeling that there's like a self-hatred mm. to a certain degree. So is that also an element in this? Is there a string of that I, that might I be happening? I definitely think that's true. Um, one thing that I did notice that kind of goes opposite of what you're saying is that it's a way for Iranians who are living in Iran to rebel right um. it there's this idea that you can't or you shouldn't have any kind of western things in iran right like wearing jeans is kind of frowned upon by the more conservative elements so for women who like can't show their hair and they have to wear the rusari or hijab getting a nose job that was emblematic of like what a white nose looks like was a way for them to push back subtle forms of resistance is kind of like how I would look at it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we don't really see a lot of is stories out of Iran about the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. We hear about the regime, but we don't hear about Iranian people. So what can we do to get more stories like that? It's a great question, and I think it goes back to having 
people from minority communities or communities from the diaspora be able to tell their own stories. And that's why I really feel like now is the most important time for people of color to go into the journalism field. Um, we're starting to see this shift where you know white editors are getting booted out and you're having people of color you know be the ones in charge and dictating what the news should be. And I really want to see people in this room leading that charge in the future. Um, it's so important, and I've even seen pushback happen in my own newsroom, you know, regarding that, and it's such a shame. Um, and I'll give you an instance of why this is so important now. Um, we're talking about tougher sanctions on Iran. Well, how is that affecting the Iranian people? You know, there's medical issues that might arise. We don't really see stories about that. We see about the conflict and the pushing and the you know tit for tat between these two countries and the geopolitics of it. But why not talk about the human element? How are people affected by it? So one of the things that you and I talked about previously is that one of the things that is affecting the Iranian di diaspora is that many of them don't feel comfortable even going back to the homeland. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what impact that's happening on Iranian Americans here are is there more of a separation is are they just not connected with what's happening with their families anymore what's happening with that it's really good that's a really good point um, you know Iranian Americans right now I believe feel hesitant in going back to their home country and, and what that means is that they go years without seeing their family you know my mom wasn't able to see her mom for 40 years and then she died you know, it's just like families are being separated. Um, that's not to say that, you know, Iranian Americans don't travel to Iran, but it's really hard when you hear news of prominent Iranian Americans being detained. Um, you know, Jason Rezanian, who was supposed to join us here, he was the Washington Post um, former bureau chief um, in Iran, and he was detained for years, and it wasn't until you know, John Kerry under the Obama administration was able to free him. But since then, I mean, more people have been detained in Iran. And seven non-journalists. Non-journalists, business, business people, um, you know, dual citizens, even permanent residents. Um, and they use the Iranian government uses it as like a bargaining chip. Um, one interesting thing is that under the Trump administration, his hostage negotiation strategy has been much stronger than the Obama administration, according to some people I've spoken to. So he's able to free people much faster, at a faster rate. Um, and that's because you know he elevates it, he embeds himself in the narrative of like freeing people. Um, but it's come at an expense for Iranian Americans who are being detained in Iran. Um, and it's because tensions are so fierce right now. You have tougher sanctions being imposed, he backed out of the nuclear deal. So it's this paradox almost where he really wants to free Americans who are detained abroad, but it comes out of In other countries. In other countries, of, mm -hmm. right. Um, I mean, take North Korea, for instance. He was able to free um, uh, hostages there, but that's great. But for Iranian Americans, it's just a whole different story because of the geopolitics and his foreign policies towards that country. So when Trump was talking at the UN the other day, I, I was really struck by his comments. Well, there's so many comments <laughs> I was struck by, but uh, one of them was this, and was almost like a, just a mention, almost not even something he went into in great detail, mm -hmm. but he talked about what seemed to me to be an announcement of regime, wanting regime change mm -hmm. there. And so I was like, what? I just, it just struck me because I hadn't heard any other conversation about that. And so I'm wondering what your insights are on that. Are we about to go to war to, with Iran? It's something that the Trump administration has definitely denied. But when you look behind that rhetoric, there are issues that really trouble me and that I believe or might be leading to this um, idea that regime change might happen. And that's because for the first time, there are people in the White House who back the MEK. And for those of you who don't know the MEK, it's this um, group of Iranians who are exiled. They want regime change in Iran, but they're this like cultish group. So they do really crazy things, and they've done crazy things. They were living in Iraq at a time. You know, they believe that they're the ones that can go back and rule the secular democratic Iran and kick the current Islamic Republic, you know, Ayatollahs out. 
they're, they're crazy, is my point. Um, but for the first time, you have people in the Trump administration, such as um, John Bolton and Giuliani, who are backing the MEK. And it's crazy. It's like they, they, are, they used to be on the state terrorism list. And now, you know, there's people in the administration who are backing this group. Um, I mean, John Kerry went on the TV the other day and said that, you know, it, it appears that there's regime change on the, on the table. Wow. Scary. Um, I wonder what will happen. I don't know. What do you think? I would love to know. I was. I feel like I'm not an expert on the region, me but I was really nervous and very struck by that, and yeah. very, very concerned. Yeah. So I feel like it's a harbinger for things that are not good. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, but it's another example of why it's important to know these different actors and these different groups. Like for people who don't know MEK, they wouldn't understand. Well. What, why is this rhetoric, why does it matter now, right? Um, but who is talking about the MEK? Right? I, don't really I, I, I don't think before we had our conversation that I even knew anything about the MEK. And it's hard. Um, it takes so much work. When you're on deadline and you're writing something up, you don't have time to really go in that back history. I mean, I've had to spend my outside time reading and carrying around <laughs> history textbooks and academic journals just to be able to stay on top of things. So is that something you would recommend that young aspiring journalists do? Oh, absolutely. I have a book in my bag right now that's just like a textbook that I had from college. Um, and like, bless their souls, these academics who write these papers, like I would just depend on them. Like you wouldn't be, you'd be amazed by like all the papers that you need to do like your essays with, how much it comes in handy like down the line. Like, I saved it all. <laughs> Thank God I did, because I saved my money. <laughs> <laughs> so it must be really difficult to be a journalist these days. You know, I've been talking to my students about how they need to pay attention to everything that's going on, just so that they even know who the players are. But how do you do it? Like, what is your routine of news consumption? Mm, um, <clears throat> I wake up in the morning. First thing I do is I check my email, and then I go on Twitter. And, and then from there, I just read mostly you know activists and other journalists from within those countries that I'm covering so that I stay up to date on stuff um, and I constantly reach out to my sources you know that's one thing that I feel like in terms of getting scoops um, you just want to call up your sources and just be like hey what's up you know what's new and send them thank yous um, uh, stay in touch with them and it doesn't have to be necessarily a I mean, okay, keep it professional. I'm not suggesting you to do anything crazy with them, but you know, be friendly. Like you're developing a relationship, just like how you network. You don't want to, you know, appear to be this strict person that it's a, you know, you're asking something. It's a give or take, right? Um, so that's how I would treat sources. So it seems that in some ways, journalists um, have abdicated their independence, like. The Trump administ administration will spend something. It's so easy to sort of get lost, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend? Like, what do you think journalists should really be doing to maintain their independence and also to focus on really what's important? Because I feel like there's so much yeah. information now, and a lot of it is not really that important. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's very true. I mean, for myself, I keep a Google doc of like different things that are important so for example the Trump Russia investigation I have like a Google Doc of that and I just keep all like the news clips and timelines of that then I have like a different like folder for Iran and just like in order to get my head straight so that I'm not mm -hmm. distracted by all this like rhetoric that doesn't mean much um, it's hard and sometimes it's important just to take like a mental health day like just get away from the news and that to me because it's so emotionally draining for me sometimes just to be fully immersed in it because you get attached to you know issues and you know it's, it's mm -hmm. just you need to take care of yourself too <laughs> it's so important self-care is really hard right. so how do you do that how do you i like, drink wine <laughs> <laughs> honestly <laughs> lots of wine and cheese <laughs> and that makes me feel better and i pet my dogs okay. that's what i love um but you know nature some people hiking is a great way, exercising. Um, what is it for you? I have to. For me, me some walking ideas. my dog, <laughs> hanging out with my dog, and yeah, yeah, dogs are good. 
They're definitely <laughs> very therapeutic. I don't know where right? I'd be without my dog. I know. <laughs> I know. It's so true. Dogs are the best. <laughs> yeah. So um, I wanted to touch on the women's movement. So mm-hmm. you mentioned something about, and I don't think most people here know, that in Iran there is this sense that women feel liberated to a certain degree there. Maybe liberated isn't the right word, but maybe you can talk about some examples of how women feel like they're making a place for themselves in Iran. And what we can learn here in this Me Too movement Mm. that's happening here in the US. Right, no, exactly. When it comes to the Middle East, I feel like there's this dominant narrative in the West that women are oppressed, Um, The men are barbaric savages, and the entire culture is backward, right? And I call that, you know, Orientalism. Um, And Edward Said really described it very well. And you see that rhetoric perpetuated in mainstream media quite frequently, and I don't think journalists necessarily do it on purpose, but it can be very easy to swipe, you know, sweep an entire country in, like, monolithic terms. Um, And in order to counter that narrative, I think a good way is to look at Iranian women currently today and how they actually have their own agency. You know, it's one thing to be able to say, yes, what's happening in Iran, the leaders, they're, you know, having horrible human rights and women are suffering. That's absolutely true. But, you know, women are also pushing back. And that to me shows that they have a sense of agency and that they're able to counter this narrative that they're oppressed peoples. And this women's movement, I believe, emerged, you know, quite after the revolution. Um, The literacy rate in Iran for women is very high. Um, Women are uh, in the private sector they're working. They're also entrepreneurs. Um, Take social media, for instance. There's viral videos of, you know, women dancing, um, taking off their hijabs or rusaris. Um, These are all acts of defiance. And when you look at how oppressive society is, it's kind of empowering to know that despite all their hardships, they are coming together and saying that, you know, no, we want a different society. Um, What is the regime doing in response to those things? Like the viral videos, that's the next Yeah, I, I mean, they're trying to clamp down on that. Any form of dissent, in my view, is a threat to their identity. And they can't allow that if they want their regime to continue. It's upsetting because when you look at it, politics in Iran is actually very nuanced. So you have Rouhani, who's the president right now, and he is you know, this face of like the moderate kind of cons- political group. But when you see this record, he might be calling for more human rights. He might be calling for women to have more rights. But has he actually been able to do that? No. But it, to me, it's great that you see this pushback happening. Um, what kind of power does he really have? It's limited. It's limited. But the power he does have has made a huge difference. I mean, could the nuclear deal have happened under Ahmadinejad? No. So his, his voice and what he stands for does carry weight, I believe. Is it, does it carry weight because there are, the, the public is behind him, more or less? I think or so, is it, yeah. Okay. Um, and he carries weight because the people that he puts in his cabinet also have those same views. Has he been able to really enact those policies that he stands for, such as you know more unblocking Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. No, unfortunately. I feel like now more than ever, we're seeing this convergence of the hardliners and you know the moderates come together because of how worried they are from what the US is doing. Um, so the outlook doesn't look too good, in my opinion, at the moment. So if women are dissenting, what are the consequences for them? Are they ostracized? Um, do their husbands, you know, mm-hmm. not like it? Um, are they hauled off to jail? Like, what are the consequences of their defiance? They could be taken to jail. Um, there's many human rights defenders right now, lawyers, uh, women lawyers who are being sent to jail because they're standing up for people who are accused of uh, national security issues, which is the euphemism for, you know, trying to stand up against human rights abuses in Iran. Um, but 
what I enjoy seeing the most is when men stand up and they're demanding also you know, rights for women. And you see that happening in you know, videos that have gone viral recently. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I'd like to um, open up this up to questions to the audience. I'm sure you guys have a lot of a lot of questions. Rochelle, um, you mentioned that you were uh, that you were half Jewish and half Muslim, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how it informs your your work as a journalist and how it helps you in certain communities and in the um, in some ways it doesn't really hurts or makes it difficult. Yeah, I, I really feel thankful that the experience I had in my undergrad, as difficult as it might have been, because I felt ostracized at times in the Jewish community and I felt like I was never fully welcomed in um, you know, the Palestinian activism community. I, I took that and it was very emotionally distressing at times, but I realized that it made my voice that much stronger because when you write articles, you want to hear that pushback. You don't want to just write for people who will agree with you. So, for instance, if I'm writing a story about how the Jewish community, for instance, in LA, the Persian Jewish community, there's strong, um, there's strong sentiments that they actually do like Trump, which kind of goes against what people might think. And I expect pushback from that article because it goes against what the norm is. Um, but at the same time, I feel like I'm able to write that because I know those nuances. Um, and that to me is very powerful. I think when it comes to talking about Palestinian issues, I tend to not want to do that in my writing at the moment. Um, but I expect that if I do, I, w- I would definitely want my audience to be one that wouldn't necessarily agree with me. And that to me is empowering. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, I guess I, I was thinking in terms of um, making contacts in mm. those different communities and building trust and rapport. How they respond, how, how they, they respond, respond to you. Mm. Whether you use that, whether you talk about that, or whether you... I, I do, and you know, I really like making those contacts and those connections. I don't find that it's difficult. I feel like if you come at it from such a, a point when you want to hear the other side and you're genuinely listening to them, no one can really say that you're being fake. Right? And that's kind of how I approach it. And so I've made really strong connections with people who I know might not necessarily agree with me, um, or they don't necessarily trust my reporting, but they still want to talk to me because I made sure that their voice is heard. And I think that's a lesson that you can take across the board. But do you announce that you are half Jewish? Half I do. M- okay. Oh, yeah. And I think they love hearing that. Like, you know, when I talk to sources, I don't want to just make it seem like I'm asking them questions. I also, you know, give a little bit about my life. And that humanizes things, right? Like, yeah. you feel like people trust you when you talk to them, like, you know, you're their friend. And so I always do that, like, yeah, you know, this is my life, right? Like, my parents are divorced and I had a hard time growing up, yada, yada. Like, that's true, <laughs> you know? And um, that makes things easier. Yeah. Yes. What's your method when you're talking to uh, sources to record the conversation? Um, when I'm making phone calls and I'm behind a desk at a computer, I like type really fast. Um, when I'm out doing like man on the street interviews, I write it by hand. Um, and if it's like a really important conversation with like a public official, I record it. Um, especially when it's something that I want to make sure I have on, if it's on the record versus off the record, I like to record those. And I always go back and I ask those sources, okay, so you said that this was on the record. You said that this was off the record. Is that clear? And that makes sure that you have your back, you know, everything's in check. What's the downside of recording? You have to transcribe, which sucks. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. It's really tedious. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it takes so much time, yeah. and you can, like, use it as an excuse not to actually do the writing. Right. Like, right. oh, I have to transcribe. You know, I can't actually write it right, right now. Until I, right, I need yeah. to know everything that's <laughs> Exactly, <in there. laughs> exactly. I know so many reporters who make that excuse for themselves, like, oh wait, I haven't you know, transcribed this interview, I need to go do that. It's like, no, yeah. just write the story. Right. Sometimes you don't need to transcribe everything, and just like listen, and that's why writing by, you know, by hand can be more effective sometimes. 
So I've been talking to my students about note taking. Mm -hmm. What secrets do you have to good note taking? Do you do shorthand? I do shorthand. Yeah, yeah, I do shorthand. Not all reporters no, do shorthand. No, no, and it's really hard. Like you have to be fast, and that's that's what I do. And I go back right afterwards and I type up what I wrote by hand if I can. Daniel. Um, I've often wondered. I know that news. I know that we have the First Amendment, which protects freedom of the press. Does that protect college newspapers as well as larger newspapers? Absolutely. I would hope, right? Especially if um, if you come up against something that's difficult and you want to show it and prove it. College newspapers, absolutely. I feel like they're at the forefront of being able to do a lot of great digging and investigative work because they're at an institution and they have great access to things. And there's many instances of college newspapers actually breaking really important news. Yes? Would you be willing to say why you're not into covering Palestinian mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah, um, I feel like for myself at the moment, if I were to write about that, I, I wouldn't feel like I'm being genuine with myself in the sense that I want to give the audience unbiased information. And when I was working at Al Jazeera English, for instance, I was writing op-eds and analysis pieces about the conflict. And so what that did for me is um, I kind of inserted my own thoughts and my own personal experiences, so I feel like it wouldn't be fair for me to necessarily write about those issues at the moment until like I had time to take a step back and really like feel like I have the right again to write about that issue. You feel that like you can't sense. be impartial enough. Right, exactly, exactly. Versus. Um, Melissa, uh, I think that there's a statistic that something like two percent of op-eds are written written by, written and published by mm. women. So, and op-eds function as a kind of thinking about policy. Um, do you find that the same is true in, across journalism editors mm. um, of newspapers? Is it still predominantly men? And is it still predominantly uh, an industry that kind of reproduces I mean, you know, like looking at some of the hearings this morning, I was like, wow, you know, there's two women mm -hmm. senators on this committee. Um, but that wasn't the case, you know, when Anita Hill came before this judicial committee. And I think it's so um, important that women are part of the sort of apparatus of the newspaper or journalism industry. And I wonder if you know anything about that. And it's so hard sometimes. I, I feel like it hasn't improved. There aren't many female editors. There aren't many female editors who are in charge at the management level. And as a person of color who's female, it's very difficult to navigate that newsroom landscape because you're dealing with so much politics. And so for myself, I feel like I'm at a disadvantage already before I even walk inside the newsroom. I'm a disadvantage because I'm not a white, you know, white person. You know, I'm, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm a minority. You're young also. I'm young, right? And that can be a huge detriment when you're starting off in the journalism industry right away. You need advocates, you need like editors to have your back. And that's something like I've struggled with. It's so hard because you just want to go into work and like put your head down and just write the stories. That's not really what actually happens. You have to deal with gossip. There's a lot of politics in the news. There's a lot, man. I tell you, the stress from work doesn't come from the stories. It comes from the politics in the newsroom. <clears throat> and it's taken a toll on me. And it's in every newsroom, honestly, but it's bad. I mean, just get ready to have thick skin. And it's not just about the competition. It's about navigating like the favoritism that happens, you know? favoritism when it comes to opportunities. People who are paid more typically are the white, older reporters. Um, they don't give opportunities to young people of color, let alone females. It's just how it is. And it's so demoralizing. So how do you, what would you, what advice would you give to students about how they can prepare themselves for that kind of environment? Um, 
I would suggest that when you first enter a newsroom to take a step back and evaluate your space and then come up with a strategy. Find people who you feel like are good people who have your best interests at heart and do not stick to people who gossip. Like I think it can be really easy at first to want to yeah. gravitate towards them because they're the ones that are most open, but stay far away. <laughs> Far, far away. And don't engage in the gossip. Don't engage. Don't engage. It will come to bite you um, later on. And, and you just pitch, pitch. And, and if your ideas aren't heard or validated at first, go and do the stories on your own time. And I work on the weekends. There's no such thing as free time when you're a journalist. I really believe that. <laughs> Um, and have fun with it, but also, except when yeah. you're having your wine and cheese. Oh yes, oh yes, that's like me time. Have me time, and when you're petting dogs, right? right. Yeah. Right. There is there's a question right here. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Melissa, my name is Mahmoud Moshkoya, uh, Minister of Politics here at the school. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you questions about the political questions about U.S.-Iran relations, but first, my compliment. Uh, for a wonderful and very touching story that you told us. Um, uh, On to the question, uh, I have often thought that U.S.-Iran relations, that since at least 1979, Iran revolution have taken a sort of different turns. I've often thought that the United States and Iran can be natural allies mm -hmm. because they have more commonality in terms of their interests as opposed to areas of conflict. For instance, they are both against the rise of radical Sunni uh, um, religious groups in, in the region. Iran can be a stabilizing factor in Afghanistan, can be the same factor in Iraq. Iran has supported Armenia vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan. Armenians are Christians. Azer Azeris are, are Sunni Muslims. And there are few spots, uh, even in the case of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Iranians have been very outspoken about saying that if there is a peace between the two parties, we certainly recognize that and we respect that. But there is no peace, you know, and that's a different story. But there are very few spots, like you know, civil war in Syria, maybe the questions of Lebanon, mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not even sure that the Iranian involvement in Yemen is very strong, or I don't even today uh, think that the Iranian support of Hamas is very strong, because I don't think Iranians have that money that is kind of funneled through them. Rather, I think Hamas is very strongly supported by NGOs in, throughout the, the Middle East. I was, I was hoping to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, I think that it's a really important point. I feel that U.S. Iran are natural allies. I also feel like Iran and Israel are natural allies, and it was the case before the um, 1979 Islamic Revolution. One thing to note is that Iranians inside the country and here love America, and that goes against the dominant narrative, which is you know Iranians are this crazy war mongering, you know, backward civilization. Um, whether that's possible now, I don't think so. I think that during the Obama administration, we were starting to see that shift where we were holding Israel more accountable, um, uh, where we actually were telling them straightforwardly that a two-state solution doesn't seem to be happening. Um, I think that we were starting to have you know, rapprochement with Iran, and they're less isolationist, and we were welcoming to that, but I don't see that happening anytime soon at the moment. I'd be curious to talk to you later about your thoughts on that. Um, and it's unfortunate because we don't hold Saudi Arabia to the same accord. You know, they're awful at human rights, what they're doing in Yemen and whatnot. And here we are talking about Iran as the leading state sponsor of terrorism, which yes, sure, of course, but let's hold other people to that same standard. Do you think Iran is, is right in this attack that happened on their one of their military parades? Do you think the Saudis were behind that oh, attack? I or? Yeah, I don't I don't know about that. Uh, it's hard because there's saying ISIS is claiming responsibility. There's you know a, a fraction of like an offshoot in Iran that's claiming responsibility for that attack. I don't know, but I know that the way that mainstream media outlets in America reported it was awful. You know. What, what was wrong with it? What did I felt what did like they do wrong? 
we didn't characterize it as a terrorist attack that you would see. Um, for example, there was a New York Times article that described it as like a humiliating blow to the Revolutionary mm -hmm. you know, Guards Corps. I think I said that right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that's not a very sensitive way of talking about it because you also had innocent civilians who died in that terrorist attack. And that was just an awful headline and, and the discourse in that article was bad. I mean, that's just one example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes? Do you face a backlash due to your advocacy on Iran and how do you respond to opposing <coughs> I haven't gotten any backlash. Um, I get a lot of hate mail <laughs> from people. It's just mostly criticizing um, stories I write about immigration and that's easy to just kind of like toss it to the side. Um, the emails I do respond to are the ones that are um, questioning my integrity when it comes to my reporting and that's something I don't take lightly so if you are confident in what you reported and someone questions that I would say that that would be a good reason to respond to it. Um, if any backlash I've gotten it's from my family you know <laughs> so you know, what, for what's things, been the backlash from um, So they don't necessarily approve of some of the things I've written when it comes to Iran, um, right? There's this narrative when it comes to Iranians who moved here right after the revolution that they are pro-Shah, and that's something that differs from Iranian Americans who are first generation or second generation, I've noticed. So, you know, we can go back and forth on that, um, or even like my family, um, on my Jewish side, they don't necessarily agree with some of the things that I write about, um, pushing back on it, but that's just something where you have to have thick skin. I, that's where my wine and cheese comes in. <laughs> <laughs> Would you characterize your work as being activist work? No, I wouldn't, and that's something that I really push back hard on. I don't view myself as an activist. I view myself, as, if anything, as a neutral reporter that writes analysis pieces sometimes, but that comes from, again, context, history, <coughs> and conversations with you know, you know, people in the academic world. Somebody had their hand up over here. Yes. I had two short questions. Um, how were you able to get into journalism at UC San Diego? Because they don't entirely have a journalism major. Right. And then how did you find the Al Jazeera internship? Mm -hmm. Good question. So I didn't do journalism as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. I was mostly doing um, kind of organizing work. I managed to find the internship through my contacts. And that's something I really recommend everyone to do. Um, it's hard when you're trying to get that first foot in the door and sending out your resume necessarily isn't enough these days. You have to be prepared to travel and get ready to move to a different state if you need to find a journalism internship. You have to sit down and invite journalists out for coffee and don't ask for something right away when you're first meeting with them because you know you don't know them. It's about building that relationship like you would do with the source. Um, the only way I got my Washington Post job was because I met someone years earlier who saw my resume when I was applying for it and was like, yeah, I know this person. They're nice. That's really what it comes down to. Because, you know, you're working with someone. You're nice, and then, you know, he saw my resume, he saw my clips. Clips are the one thing that matters mo more than anything if it's, like, your reputation and your clips. Sometimes resumes, they don't even look at that. It's what you write, you know. So if you're going to leave with, like, one important piece of information today, I'd say, like, find that story you want to write and write it really well. And that's your foot in the door. Yes. On uh, security, uh, it'd be interesting to see your passport mm. or passports. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, an Israeli stamp and a passport will keep you out of an awful lot of countries. Yeah, no, it's true, especially because um, I have a stamp from Gaza. Whenever I go to Israel, I always get stopped in security, and that can be really intimidating. So anyone out there who is aspiring to be a foreign correspondent, I mean, it's just natural to carry like two passports around. For me, I've had to get three or four different passports and just like discard old ones because I have stamps from Israel and then Gaza, and it's just like a nightmare. Um, that just comes with the territory. It's kind of exciting though too. <laughs> How do you carry two passports? Um, well, there's something where you can apply for one. I don't have that. Um, 
I just typically use one passport and I discard the old one that oh, has see. like the Gaza stamp on it and stuff. Um, but it's definitely things you have to think about when you're becoming a foreign journalist. So you could have two passports, it's possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Christian? You were talking about uh, the politics in the newsroom and uh, as journalism professors trying to figure out how to help our students navigate mm-hmm. what's going to happen when they get to a newsroom. Our students do work in newsrooms now, but uh, on campus. But, but what, what can journalism programs do mm-hmm. to help the students figure these things out? Like what advice would you have liked to have heard from your professors? What classes were missing that you would have liked to have? So, I wish I had someone tell me what it meant to have an advocate in a newsroom. What it means to have an editor to really sit down with you and edit a story. Um, what it means to have conversations about a story idea. How much is too much when you're first trying to figure out if your story is a good story and it's newsworthy. Um, and really navigating that political environment inside a newsroom. What does it mean to have an advocate and how can you find one? Building those relationships is so difficult because you're dealing with like an authoritative figure, but you also have to be nice and outgoing and like joke around. But how can you do that with an editor that's kind of your boss? It can be kind of like mind boggling. So I would love to hear your advice, honestly. Like, I'm still figuring it out. I feel, (laughs) when I was in the newsroom, one of my difficult things was I often had editors who had no clout in the system. Mm. So I had advocates, but they weren't um, effective advocates because they just weren't respected in the chain of command. So how do you know which advocate (coughs) to choose? I feel like there's always those few editors that are the most well-liked and they know how to please like the management and getting buddy-buddy with them can seem so fake for me. Like I don't want to be fake in my relationships, but for the people who have succeeded, in my newsroom at least, it's the ones that have managed to do that and it's awful. And I hate it, but I really feel like it's the only way. I mean, it's just so common to go grab drinks with your editor after work. But, you know, at what point is that too much? At what point can you say you have that relationship with an editor? At what point can you say, well, am I being too professional? Should I be more laid back? Or, like, do I need to be more professional? Like, it's just so hard figuring that out. And I still don't even know. I I think (laughs) that takes us to this discussion about the Me Too movement in Mm -hmm. media, right? So how, what should um, female, most, I would just say mostly female, Mm -hmm. reporters do to like develop strong professional relationships but also protect themselves from advances, unwanted advances? It's hard. I think that we're at the point now though where editors are taking it seriously. And there have been conversations where editors are trying to hold reporters more accountable and try to have the backs of, you know, female journalists. What's happened at the LA Times? From what I can disclose, (laughs) um, gossip has been a really big issue. So we had management talk to us about it. And they realized that it was getting to be a huge issue because we had a situation where, you know, reporters were just not acting professionally. And it turned out that they were able to realize that they just weren't being good managers. A good manager is fair, and they know what's happening to their reporters. But if you don't know what's happening to your reporters, that's when it's, you know, a manager's responsibility. And they realize that finally. But it takes years to reverse that culture. Right. And I think we're at the point now with, like, we're trying to do that. Do you think there are younger women... uh in the newsroom now who are sort of pushing back? Are they, are they the ones who are sort of spearheading this movement within, mm. within the newsroom? Or are you seeing older women who've been there a while and finally saying they're inspired by what they see happening outside of the industry and they're just like, they're fed up and I'm just gonna say something right now and we're gonna get rid of this stuff? I think this pushback is coming from female women of color and it's a pushback that's happening unfortunately against 
other young reporters who necessarily don't have that professionalism as they should. Um, I'm not sure I understand. What yeah, you mean. and then it's very it's <laughs> very you, complex. I, okay. Um, I think that I'll just say this: young female people of co women of color are, are the ones leading the charge. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? If you could write a story that might offer a different narrative about Iran, what would you want people to see and hear about mm. either Iranians in Iran or Iranians who live in the United States? It's a good question. I have to think about that more. I wish I had more time to focus on a story like that. We're chasing dailies so often and that I wish I could write more human interest stories. So I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> Do you think the LA Times is changing since it has a new, mm. a new owner? I are think you, so. Are you seeing shifts in what's happening in the culture of the newsroom, but in addition to that, in the kinds of story it's, it's going after? Absolutely. We're putting more emphasis on investigations. We're putting more emphasis on um, treating reporters fairly and giving them better pay. I think that's something that we're going to see. Um, we finally get free coffee and free parking. <laughs> it's those small things that matter. And so I think we're going in the positive direction. I see ourselves right now where the Washington Post was just when um, it got bought out by Bezos. And when you say pay, um, improved pay, do you mean like pay equity across gender? Or what do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, pay equity across gender. Um, for females, there's a discrepancy for young women of color and even their white female counterparts, there's a pay discrepancy. Um, with male white reporters, there's a huge discrepancy when it comes to minorities and female women of color. And so we're trying to close that gap at the moment. And I think that our management is taking that issue seriously and with that comes more professionalism in the newsroom. So I think the changes that are happening are very, um, positive. A while ago, you know, when I was a young person in the 80s, I remembered a lot of stories, and this is, of course, was soon after the Iranian revolution, mm -hmm. but you saw a lot of stories about things happening in the Iranian American community here, but you, I don't see those stories anymore. Why is that? It's so hard sometimes to convince editors that a story is worthwhile if they don't come from that culture. And that's why it's so important that we have different minorities. But even, I mean, at that time, we mm. were seeing a lot of stories about that community. Mm -hmm. So what has changed between now and then, I guess? I have to think about that. What's changed since now and then? I wish I could tell you. I don't think there should be less stories. I wish there were more. I think that newsrooms haven't placed a enough, well, I think it's easy. Okay, well, the first of all, we just have less reporters to do it, that much okay. reporting. So the business model has shifted. Um, and I wonder, maybe there's less interest in those stories. I hope not. Um, for me, the struggle has been convincing my editor, though, because mm -hmm. there's still reporters who I know that are trying to get those stories written. But there's definitely less attention span from editors who want those stories. All right. Anything else? Yes. Absolutely. Can you comment on the Trump administration's approach vis a vis Iran when it seems to me that this administration is speaking out of both sides of its mouth? On, on the one hand, they are calling Iran a terror sponsored group and, and brutal and uh, a country which is in the business of death and destruction, but on the other hand, they are inviting Iran for a dialogue. So, so do you think this like the North Korean approach toward Iran, do you think it's going to work? I don't think it's going to work because, as I'm sure any Iranian such as yourself in the room knows, we're very much about respect and protocol and doing things strategically. And the Trump administration, unlike the Obama administration, doesn't understand those nuances when it comes mm -hmm. to Iranian culture. And I think Trump's whole thing is theatrics. I mean, he's a reality television star. Even when it comes to like North Korea, it's all about theatrics. And that's what we're seeing with Iran. I mean, look at this back and forth that happens on Twitter. 
I mean, man, who would have thought five years ago Twitter is the place where we're going to see this kind of rhetoric from world leaders on foreign policy? In foreign policy, in foreign <laughs> policy nonetheless. <laughs> right. I mean, this is why I wake up in the morning and I'm like, all right, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> um, so it's all theatrics. That's what it is. Yes. Sure. No, it's right here for the journalism students. Daniel. One more. I noticed you said that um, women in Iran and Iran felt at first like liberated, but then you say later that they're being like in jail for putting in, put in jail for like standing up for their rights. Mm hmm. What, how, what was the reason that is, it, is, is, it, is that because more recently that the liberation has not happened? I think there was a conservative movement after the revolution in which um, they were finally able to say that, you know, we are able to wear the Ruseri, we want to do that. Um, and then with that, later on, you're seeing that necessarily there's human rights abuses happening against women. And it doesn't matter if you have to wear the veil, if you're being forced to wear the veil, it goes against what women want, right? It should be about choice. And that's the kind of human rights element that I think we're seeing emerge post-revolution. So, 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 so the, so the post-revolution, so right after the revolution they felt liberated, but then later they felt like the, that there was the danger of like going to jail and whatnot? Right, right. I think there was opposing groups at the time, right? There's the conservative group who definitely wanted to see a more religious law and society in place, and so they were the ones that were happy. Um, and then later on, you're, saying, you're seeing society kind of shift and change. And in my view, that's where those elements of, well, we don't want to wear the you know, hijab, the ruseri. Um, we should have more freedoms. We shouldn't have this patriarchy where like, the male gets to decide um, you know, if the woman can leave the country. Examples such as that, that they're pushing back against now. OK. Mm -hmm. President Rahm. <clears throat> Sorry, the word was mentioned once, but I, I've got to ask you this. The, uh, would you ever consider writing uh, an article about the influence of just Sunni and Shia differences and how they've been not only weaponized but politicized? Uh, it seems like that's the least understood mm. notion in America. I agree with you. I would agree with you. I would, I would be more than interested in writing that. I guess my first question is, well, what would be the news peg to that, right? Um, I can think off the bat that one story would be, why have there been less terrorist attacks happening in Iran than other countries? And I think we can bring in that element of the Sunni Shia because, you know, Iranians are Shiite, and it's just harder to have like people from the outside come in and influence them where there's not that back and forth within and inside Iran, but then on the outskirts you have minority groups in Iran that are conflicting with the Shiites. I mean, there's so many ways of bringing that issue about. But you're absolutely right. That's one thing that we definitely have to think more about. I saw one last question here. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you about Twitter. Uh, you um, I was just reading an article, I think it was in Al Jazeera, that there is a, now a camp in Albania with 1,500 of the MEK. Mm -hmm. um, the camp is set up by the United States, and there are trolls that are basically creating content on Twitter. Um, with the reliance on Twitter as a source mm -hmm. for information, um, what is your take on, you talked about your reliance on Twitter. How do we, how do we account for mm -hmm. where this content is coming from and where it's coming, where is it getting manufactured and how to decipher between the fake and the truth? That's such a good question. I didn't even bring that up. It's so hard to verify information, especially on Twitter, if those sources are reliable or not. Because as you mentioned, there are fake accounts, you know, from MEK members that are trolling and trying to, you know, twist the narratives on what's real and what's not. 
for me, I always like to have a direct conversation with the person on Twitter and if possible, a phone conversation. Um, and I never rely Twitter for Twitter on people who have extreme radical views. Um, I tend to use Twitter to find sources like a man on the ground kind of interview. So if I can't be in a country, for instance, and I want to get people's thoughts on an issue, that's when I use Twitter and I use its like advanced settings in order to find those people who aren't like those trolls or those bots. And there are um, mechanisms you can use. I know there's like websites where you can put in a Twitter account and figure out like what the percentage is that they mm -hmm. might be bots. Um, and I've had conversations with people on Twitter who've actually spotted out, hey, this is a fake account. You know, and there's fake accounts for, I mean, Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. like they have like a Santa Barbara headline, like a San Francisco headline. I'm like, they're, they're all over. So if you're trying to talk to someone in another country via Twitter mm -hmm. and you just don't know who they are, do you try to get a phone conversation with them? Like, what do you... I do. do you verify that they're a person, right. at the very least? I do phone calls. If it's a person in another state, I run a LexisNexis search on them. I try to confirm you know, their home address. I see if they have like a voter registration account. I mean... Those are all important things that we do, the editor does, the copy desk does. If it's a person in a different country, you know, I, I try to look up and get their credentials as much as possible. But LexisNexis has been amazing. Um, do your students have access to that? Yes, they okay, do. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what you use all the time. Great. Yeah. I think Melissa will um, stick around a little sure. bit if, if there are individuals who have uh, questions for her or want to have a conversation with her. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me.